When Zapier doesn't have the integrations or features that you're looking for, you don't need to give up on building the automation. Instead, you can just use an API call to create the functionality yourself. In this video, I'm going to show you how to write an API call in Zapier. Hi, I'm Tom from X-Ray Tech, the workflow company. At X-Ray, we help companies streamline their processes with no-code and low-code workflow automation. If you'd like to see more videos about automation, AI, and productivity every single week, be sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel. Today, I'll walk you through some strategies that you can use to write API calls in your Zaps even if you're not familiar with coding. You can use these techniques for both the Webhooks by Zapier action or Zapier's new API request actions. Now let's get started. First, let's explore when and why you should use API requests or webhooks in Zapier in the first place. In most cases, you'll want to use an API call whenever Zapier doesn't natively support the functionality that you want to access. There are three main use cases for writing API calls in your Zaps. If Zapier doesn't have an integration for the app that you want to automate, you may be able to build your Zap with webhooks instead. If Zapier does support the app that you want to automate, but does not support the specific action that you want to perform, then you can try to add an action with a webhook action to make a custom API call. And finally, if Zapier supports your app and your desired action, but doesn't have all the configuration settings that you want to use, then webhooks with an API request may be able to help. Since using webhooks in Zapier is mostly about compensating for things that Zapier can't do, I'd always recommend doing a quick search on xray.tools before you commit to writing an API call. Just enter the name of the app and you'd see all of the triggers, actions, and searches that you can automate with Zapier, Make, and Workato. So even if you're pretty sure Zapier doesn't support what you're trying to do, it's worth a quick check first. Zapier updates support for their apps weekly, so you never know what might have been upgraded since the last time you tried building a workflow. Checking xray.tools will also show you if your app has support for Zapier's new API request feature. API requests are in beta at the time of this recording, and there's only a few dozen apps supported. Right now, they offer somewhat similar functionality to the webhooks by Zapier action, which we'll be using in this tutorial, but they let you skip a few steps by including authorization, which is often one of the trickiest parts of API calls. On the other hand, you will need to write the body of your request as code, and you won't be able to structure it as a simple form, so it may be easier for low coders to stick with webhooks by Zapier for now. If your app has support for API requests, you'll see that action right alongside the app's other available actions. If you don't see an API request action, or if you just don't want to write out your request with code, then you can just use the webhooks by Zapier action instead. Now let's go through creating an API call in Zapier step by step. Before we start building an API call, we'll first take a moment to confirm that we can't do what we want with Zapier's pre-built actions. Today, we want to automatically create projects in Harvest. This is something we can do with Zapier. However, we also want to make sure that every project created by this automation is set to a fixed fee of $750. Fixed fee isn't an option that Zapier gives us in the pre-built integration, so we'll need to go with an API call instead. And since API request isn't available in Zapier's Harvest integration yet, we'll need to use the dedicated webhooks by Zapier action instead. Our Zap already has a trigger to watch for a new record in Airtable. So we'll now add an action and search for webhooks by Zapier. It's going to prompt us to pick an event type. And if you're not familiar with writing code or API calls specifically, this might seem a little confusing, but don't worry. There's an easy way to make sense of it all. Your options are custom request, get, post, and put. Get will let you search for existing data inside your app. Post will allow you to create new data, and put will allow you to create new data or update existing data. Custom request will let you choose other methods like patch or delete. Zapier specifically does not natively support any delete actions across any of their integrations. So custom request will be your only option if you're trying to automatically delete something, but please be careful. You can probably figure out which will best suit your needs just based off of those previous descriptions, but this is as good of a time as any to check out your app's API docs just to be sure. You'll be referencing the API docs a lot as you start building, so you might as well start early. We'll just Google Harvest API docs, and it should be the first result. 
Harvest's API docs are very well organized and include lots of useful examples to help us get started. Unfortunately, not every app will keep neat and tidy documentation like this, but if you're struggling, you can always search for support from other users or just leave a comment down below and we'll try to help. Since we want to create a project, we'll scroll down to the Projects API section and click on Projects. Here, the doc explains all of the attributes that make up a project object in the app. These are all the settings that we have access to via Harvest's API. If it isn't listed here, then we can't add it, update it, find it, or delete it. Under Create a Project, we'll see more specific information about actually creating a project. Right at the top of the section, we can see the type of request we'll need to use, post. So we'll choose post as our event back in our Zap, then continue. When you're creating an API call in Zapier, the best approach is to start with the bare minimum information and build up from there. Your first goal should be to successfully create an object with the webhook step. Just provide the required fields and type in static data for now. Once you're done with that, you can go back and configure more specific settings or add dynamic data from earlier steps in your Zap. First, we need a URL to send our request to. We can see the last part of the URL we'll need right here, slash v2 slash projects. But we need a full URL in our webhook step to make our request work. At the bottom of the section, we can see an example of the full API call that will create a new project. In the first line after curl, we can see that URL we need to use. We'll just copy and paste it directly into Zapier, but without the quotes. If you're primarily a no-code builder, I'd recommend sticking with the form for the payload type. That will let you enter all of the data you need into each form field, similar to any other step in Zapier. With a form input, you won't need to mess around with specific coding syntax that will differ from API to API. If you're more comfortable with coding, you can choose another option like JSON or RAW, but we'll be sticking with form for today. Technically, these three formats are equivalent, so it's really up to you which one you are most comfortable with. Under this data section, we'll be filling in information for each attribute of our project object. We're going back to the API docs, and here we can see several parameters are bolded. These are parameters that are listed as required, so these are the ones that we'll start with. I'll go ahead and create a key value pair for each of them, client ID, name, is billable, bill by, and budget by. These labels are keys, and next we'll fill in the values. The client ID will tell Harvest which client we want to create the project for. We'll grab the ID from the URL bar of the clients page in our Harvest account and paste it into Zapier. This is a common trick. Logging into your SaaS tool will often show you your object ID inside of the URL bar. This works for things like Notion, Google Drive, and most modern applications. Next, we'll name our project. The API docs indicate that this parameter accepts a string, which basically means it needs text. We can give our project any name we want. We'll enter it without any quotes or other special characters. IsBillable is a Boolean parameter, which means it accepts values of true or false. Since we want our project to be billable, we'll enter true. Again, no quotes or any other special characters or capitals are needed here. Bill by also accepts a string, but in this case, the string has to match one of the four options indicated in the description. We'll bill by project and enter project exactly as it appears in the documentation. Budget by is similar to bill by. We'll enter person to set our budget based on hours per person. The remaining options can be left to their defaults for our API call. In most cases, you won't need to edit these. All of the data we want to create is in place, but we need to fill out the headers first. Headers are often used in API calls to identify and authenticate the user making the request. And just as a reminder, if you're using an API request action instead of the webhook, you won't need to include any additional headers for authorization. If we go back to the example API call that we found in our harvest docs, we can see three lines of code flagged with an H. These are the headers that we need to include in our API call. We'll add each of them as keys, leaving out the colon and quotes, authorization, harvest account ID, and user agent. 
For the values associated with authorization, we need to enter the term bearer and a space, then provide a personal access token from Harvest. We can just go to the developers section in Harvest to create a new token and copy it. We can also see our account ID in the same section, which we'll need next. Once we've pasted both of these into Zapier, we just need to provide a user agent. This simply identifies the user making the API call. I haven't been able to find specific information about what's required here. Harvest suggests using your email address, but it appears that you can put anything in this field. The API call will still work. This is an area of API calls that will differ for every application. The requirements in your header can be tricky, so be patient and test one thing at a time. Now that we have our data and headers all set, we can test this step. Success, we've created a project. If we check our Harvest account, we can see the project complete with all of the options we configured. Now that we've built our bare minimum API call, we can go back and add the optional parameters that we want to use and dynamic data generated by Zapier. Building up a simple API call and testing your changes one step at a time will be a huge help when you inevitably run into some errors. It will make it much easier to isolate the change that likely caused the error in the first place. First, we'll go back to the data section of our API call and add key value pairs for is fixed fee, which we'll set to true, and fee, which we'll set to 750 without the dollar sign. Then we'll add some dynamic data to one of the other data fields. We'll replace the project name with the name that Zapier retrieved from Airtable. We'll test it again, and it looks like everything worked. Since I mentioned it a few times earlier in the video, I'd like to give you a quick look at the other method of creating API calls in Zapier. As I said, the API request action is only available to a select list of apps right now, and you can check out that whole list by clicking on the resource board in the description down below. You can also search for your app in xray.tools to see if API request is a supported action by Zapier. Just as a quick example, we'll use the API request action from Slack. We'll pull up Slack's API docs for reference and create a new action. We'll choose API request. The API request options are somewhat similar to earlier webhook steps, but there are some key differences. As Zapier notes, authentication is handled automatically, so we don't need to include any headers for authentication. We also only pass along raw data. We currently can't enter key value pairs to convenient text fields like we could in our webhook action. But just as before, we need to provide a method and a URL, which we can find in our API docs. This will send URL encoded data. URL encoding is a bit of a pain to work with, so we could add a header to change our content type to application slash JSON. That will make our body much easier to read, and we won't have to include percent %20 for every space. We'll update it with a real channel ID and our own text. We'll test the message and check that it's sent correctly. Note that when you use the API request action, your Zapier test may be considered, quote, successful, even if your API request failed. If you were able to send a request and get a response, Zapier usually considers that to be a success, even if it returns an error from your app's API. So make sure to review the output of the step and check your tool directly before continuing.
All in all, I'd recommend that most low coders stick with webhooks by Zapier for now. API requests still have a lot of bugs to work out, and they'll require you to write out the entire body of the request, which can be difficult. If you're struggling to get authentication to work in a webhook step, then you could try out API requests instead. Otherwise, I think webhooks is the way to go, especially since requests are still in beta and limited to a few dozen tools. Before we wrap this video, I want to quickly go over the kinds of errors that you're likely to see as you try to make your own API calls. If you get an error, you'll see either a 400 response or a 500 response. If you see a 400, like a 404, that means there's an error in your configuration. Check your API docs again and make sure you've configured everything correctly. If you're still getting a 400 error, try searching on a resource like Stack Overflow for the issue to get more information. Again, keeping your API call simple to start will make it much easier to debug a problem like this there will be far fewer variables that you need to test and control for. If you see a 500 message, then there's an error in the app itself. Wait a moment and try again to see if the issue resolves itself. You'd be surprised how often it does. If you keep getting a 500 error, check to see if the app's servers are down at a site like downdetector.com. Again, linked in the resource board in the description down below. You may have to wait a while for them to address the issue, but there's nothing that you can do to fix it right now. If the tool is down with a 500 error, the tool is down. You just have to wait. Ultimately, building API calls will often require a lot of trial and error as you figure out what's working and what isn't. Just take your time, read the docs carefully, and look for help when you need it. The comments section below is a great place to start. There's also thousands of people on Zapier forums, Stack Overflow, and other communities building similar things who can give you great advice. Tools like Zapier provide thousands of integrations for popular apps, but sometimes what you want to do isn't supported right out of the box. Even if you consider yourself a no-code builder, making the jump to just a little bit of low-code with some API calls and webhooks will unlock a ton of new possibilities for you. When you want to create an integration that Zapier doesn't have, don't be afraid to open up the API docs and start reading. If you've enjoyed this video, prove you're human and like and subscribe for more automation tips every single week. If you'd like to learn more about no-code and low-code automation, follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, or Facebook, and you can find all of our content on our website at xray.tech. You can check all those links in the resources board below, and as always, don't forget, keep the flow.